Worship Center. If you're out in the hallways and you're headed this way anyway, go ahead and come on in. You made it all this way. And we're praying for, you know, it's, we're kind of in a conflict, aren't we? We pray for rain, but we, we don't want rain because that slows construction down. But then everything's, we need rain, and so we don't know how to pray. And so that's the Bible says, you know, we don't know what to ask for, so we just got to trust the Holy Spirit to pray through us and ask the right thing. Give just the right amount of rain that we'd get done in time and that our grass wouldn't die and everything wouldn't die. So, I know. I am glad you made your way. I really am. Down our little rock road. And uh, I commend you. I, listen, I, I was trying to have a stiff upper lip about this. I was trying to say, you know what? We're getting a new road and I still am. I'm very excited about our new road and no big cracks that you know, I think I had to balance my wheels, you know, three times a month just to make it down 37th Street. But now I'm just like, I'm getting a little tired of this. I'm just honest, right? I'm a little tired. So I'm parking over here and walking because I don't like walk, driving all the way around. And I, I am. I am. I'm glad you're here, though. I didn't do that this morning. I just I sucked it up and drove down the White Rock Road with you. And uh, here we are. We had a, a really neat... Uh, meeting last night with our elders and our deacons and our staff and we talked about things that matter and we prayed for our congregation and we're letting you know that we care about you and we want to love you and and lead you in loving each other and loving a lost world and we're here this morning because we want that to erupt into our world we want to come and worship we don't want to just come and sit and spectate we want to come and engage the living God that has risen from the dead and one of the lines of the song that we're going to sing, I think, during our offertory is, uh, He is trampled over death by death. I love that line because Jesus trampled over death. Through His own death, He was victorious in life. Isn't that amazing? So we get to worship that God, and I call your attention to that today so we'd be in tune. And we'd let the world fade away for a little bit. I know we've got to live in the world, but just for an hour, hour and ten minutes, we get to just be here. Be in the presence of people who love Jesus or are learning to love Jesus or moving towards that and sing and praise and celebrate. So let's do that today. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. I know our love for you is imperfect. We know that. But God, what we're celebrating today, the reason we're going to sing, the reason we're going to praise, the reason we're going to proclaim the gospel and, and, and declare your word is because of your love for us. It's perfect. It never ends. It never wavers. It never backs up. It is relentless. And God, we truly love you because you love us so perfectly. So we celebrate that today. Again, we ask for your anointing, your blessing on the music, that it would be more than music. On the message, that it would be more than a sermon that we would run face to face into you. This one morning we ask. It is in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen. Hey, we're going to stand and greet each other, and I, I, I do hope that you ex sincerely extend a hand of welcome to each other, and try to do that with somebody you hadn't seen yet this morning, and then we'll continue with our worship service. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Hi. Good morning. A double hug, a double hug. Oh, I love them. That's wonderful. <laughs> good to see you. Oh, it's good to see you. You're a blessing. You are. Christ is risen. Adults, you can be seated as the kids come up for the children's message. It's a fishing pole. 
You wondering why I got it? Because I like to fish, silly. It's hard to fish without a fishing pole. You ever tried to catch a fish without a fishing pole? I got a problem, though, with my fishing pole. You know what it is? Come on up here, sweetie. <laughs> my problem is, is I don't have anything, any bait. I have a paper clip, and that's just kind of hold the string straight. You're not going to catch many fish with a paper clip, am I? No. What do I need? I need bait and, well, I need water. I love our adults. They just, our adults really love this children's sermon. They do. I love that they engage that. Well, I need bait and I do need water. That's the obvious thing. But if I had water and I had this and there were fish everywhere, I'm still not going to catch any. Because I don't have any bait. Because we have to have something that the fish want to eat, don't we? Yeah. I've got a, I got a tackle box full of lures and you can go buy bait, whether it's minnows or worms or liver if you're fishing for catfish. But you know what? Jesus' disciples, his first disciples, they were fishermen. They knew how to fish really well. They didn't use fishing rods. They used nets to throw out and, and kind of haul in, haul in the fish. And they caught a lot of fish at once. It was probably pretty cool to see. Hundreds of fish come in a net. But one day he told his disciples, because they understood fishing, he said, I want to make you fishers of men. I want to teach you how to fish for people. That's kind of a strange idea, isn't it? How do you fish for people? Do you know? I hope we don't do this and we cast over to somebody like Mike and try to hook him and reel him in because this is only 10-pound test and Mike ain't coming. <laughs> Mike ain't coming on 10-pound test. We don't do that. You know what Jesus meant? I'll show you what he meant. He meant that we have to have not a bait in terms of tricking people, but we have to have something to offer people. If they want to know Jesus, we've got to show them Jesus. And so we hold out the cross. Do you know what the cross represents? Do you know what that stands for? What happened on the cross? Jesus died on the cross. And then our cross is empty because Jesus isn't on the cross. And where did they put him after the cross? In the what? In the grave? Yeah. But he's not in the grave anymore because you could go over outside of Jerusalem and you wouldn't find Jesus in a grave and they never did because the grave is empty because of why? Why is the grave empty? Because he rose from the dead. So the, the cross symbolizes, it represents that whole message we call the gospel and we to fish for people are holding out the gospel, the good news that Jesus trampled over death by death. He conquered death by dying and being raised back to life. That's right. So as we, fish for, as we fish for people, you know what we hold out? We hold out the good news about Jesus. We tell people about Jesus. We're not trying to trick them, man. We're telling them the truth. That death has been defeated. That heaven is real. And Jesus wants you to come there with him by placing your faith in him. You just did this really recently, didn't you? Told Jesus. You returned from your sin and turned your life over to Jesus. And we're going to baptize you real soon. And I'm excited about that. That's the gospel. You didn't bring any food? No, I didn't bring any food. Oh, we don't have to do it today. Don't worry, sweetie. We will do it soon, though. Oh, she's going to baptize me. He's going to baptize me. I got my dress on. Well, we hold out the gospel so that people will believe in Jesus so that they can have a relationship with God. And I want you to know he loves you very much. And you get to be fishers of men with me. And I'm excited about that. Let's tell people about Jesus, okay? Any chance we get, we can tell them about Jesus. No matter what, we can talk about him. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for our kiddos today, and I pray that they would grow up talking about Jesus. Every chance they get, that they would tell people about Jesus, that they would remember that they too are fishers of people. And that, God, we don't have to use a trick. We're not trying to hook people. In fact, Father, we're just going to share the truth that you love us enough to have sent your son, Jesus, to die on a cross, to be raised from the dead, to give us hope, forgiveness from our sins, and hope of eternal life through faith in Jesus. Thank you. May they be uh, willing, willing partners in the gospel. May they grow up that way. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Uh, as the kids go seated, uh, would you uh, stand and worship with us?
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name When the sun's shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. You give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above. 
echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. on heaven's mercy seat worthy is a lamb who was slain holy holy is he sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is our God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Flashes of lightning or rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Struck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath of living water, such a marvelous mystery. Yeah. Holy, holy, holy is our God Almighty. Was and is and is to come. 
with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is our Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Pray with me. God, you're the creator of the universe, and that you you died and rose again and will come again and that you've paid more than enough for us to live now, here and now and forever we're here to worship you today God you are our everything Amen you may be seated Uh, thank you, worship team. I appreciate you leading us in that. That song is, uh, it's a lot to transition from as you listen to those words. Let me pray, and I can do that a little easier. God, you are holy. Honestly, Father, I forget that sometimes. Functionally, I forget it. I approach you casually. God, I think we as a church sometimes just we value relationship um, sometimes to a point where we, we approach you casually as a church. And you are relational and you are benevolent and merciful and kind, but you're not casual. I need to be reminded of that. that just at the mention of your name, I'm awestruck. We haven't gathered for a concert or a speech. And we've gathered today to be in your presence and to worship you and to hear from you and to be moved as a congregation in a singular direction to make disciples who make disciples. To live for your glory relentlessly. To love each other radically. And to penetrate a lost world with the gospel. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for music. Speak now through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You know anybody that likes to worry? You know, before you answer that question, no, you stop and think about it. There is, you've heard people, you may be in this congregation, say, I'm a worrier. And you wouldn't say I, you enjoy it, but come on. I mean, there's some people that seem to take some delight in worrying. Almost insecure if you don't have something to worry about. We had a book. It was a kid's book called Mr. Worry. I loved this book because it just pointed something out that I needed at the time, and I read it a lot. I'm sure, I think it was Carson or Braden, uh, were like, why do you read this book to me every single night, <laughs> you know? And it was Mr. Worry. Mr. Worry worried about everything. I mean, he worried about his shadow. He worried about this. He worried about the other. And one day, Mr. Worry didn't have anything to worry about, so he worried about that. He was worried that he didn't have anything to worry about. Now, I literally know people like that or have. I don't know anybody right now, but I've known people who just, man, if everything was okay, they were worried. They were like, when's the other shoe going to fall? You know, when's something bad? What, why is it so good right now? I am worried that something really bad is going to happen now that everything's good. Does that make any sense at all? It doesn't. And that's not me, okay? So I'm not that way. I'm, you got Mr. Worry. If there was another children's book on the polar opposite side, you got Mr. Not Worry about anything. Now, I'm not saying I don't get anxious or I put my head in the sand. I'm just saying I tend not to worry. I don't enjoy worrying at all. And I'm adept at, 
at figuring out how not to worry uh, about things. Now, not necessarily in a great spiritual way. I mean, I understand the be anxious about nothing passage and turn it over to God, and I do do that, but I don't. I don't necessarily always do it that way. I just, sometimes I can immerse myself in a magazine or a television show or a hobby and just forget and switch gears in my brain. And I, when I do worry, I started thinking about this. When I do worry, what do I worry about? What worries me? What causes me to be anxious? And, and honestly, if I boiled it down, it's, it's simple. It's probably the sh something we share, is that we worry most of the time about a need or perceived need that may not be met. And, and, and sometimes it feels like a fear for me. A fear that something won't go like I want it to go. A need will continue to be unmet or won't be met. Or desire that is intense enough to feel like a need that won't be fulfilled. And that got me to thinking about what would it be like to not worry about anything? I mean, but I know that's probably, that is idealistic, to not worry. But I got to thinking about what would it be like to live free from worry? From worry, at least, about needs being met. What would that be like? Because I think most of us, if we really do say what we worry about, it's about that. It's about needs not being met. And what if we could get to a place we just didn't have any concern that a need would ever go unmet? And I don't think this part's idealistic. So follow me here. I don't think it's idealistic or, or uh, unrealistic to think that we could get to a place where we know our needs are going to be met. Because God's promised to do this. I mean, over and over in His Word, no one can deny that God has said, I'll meet your needs. Okay? Here's the problem. Is that when we think of God meeting our needs, typically we think of the proverbial check coming in the mail. All right? Like some mystical way that God is going to, you know, unforeseen way that God's going to step in and save the day at the last minute. And, you know, you've got to... $300 electric bill and no money left at the end of the month and you open the mailbox and there's the check uh, you know no return address you don't know where it's some mystical thing that and that's how we think of God meeting our needs and if that's how we think of God meeting our needs it's no wonder we worry because it doesn't happen that that's not God's main mode of operation God can do that anytime he wants God can write a check in heaven stick it in our mailboxes if he wants to it doesn't happen that way often. It's happened to me. It has. Even recently, I've had an unexpected, you know, uh, some, something from an insurance company, believe it or not, sent me money back. And I was like, wow, you know, that. thank you, Lord. I needed that at that time. But then what am I talking about if it's not that way? Because when I think of God meeting my needs, while I know he can do something about it, and he can do it supernaturally, something about the check in the mail concept just doesn't, always bring me peace because I know a lot of times that hadn't happened it's because God doesn't intend to meet our needs always in unforeseen supernatural what we perceive as miraculous ways God does not always superintend the natural with the supernatural to meet a need God has placed us you he's placed me in the middle of a spiritual family called the church. It's right here, planted in the middle of people who share a common faith, a common destiny, a common allegiance, a common purpose for living, right in the middle of a spiritual family. And it's through the assurance that God will use the resources in the family to meet the needs that we get to have the peace that my needs will never go unmet because you and I together will care for each other at that level. We're in the middle of a series called Inside Out. And the concept there is that we need to be a church who loves each other radically, having first received the love that is perfectly, profoundly, miraculously perfect from, fa from the Father. We're loved perfectly by Him through Jesus. Now we spread out and begin to love each other with that love that we have been loved with. We take care of and love each other radically inside, within the, the realm of the church. Now we talked about that culturally in the church, growth 
uh, spectrum of things today that sounds taboo to talk about because it sounds like an internal focus. And we're supposed to, the, the phraseology that is kind of fading off now, but it's still here, is that we need to be externally focused while we agree with that. Externally focused means that we're still focused on a world around us that has a desperate spiritual need to hear about Jesus. And we're not here to form a spiritual country club. We're not here to form a clique or, or a denominational stronghold. We're here to be the church, but the church is supposed to love each other radically inside so that we can love the world outside the church because the, the world outside the church it's brutal so I was praying with Ray and Roger at 8 o'clock which everybody is invited to uh, on Sunday mornings at 8 o'clock in the conference room that first door through that door on your left you can come pray with us if you want and Ray brought up this idea that man if you just look at the paper it's horrific out there I mean people everywhere are killing people just senselessly. In Nairobi, he was talking about a, a, a machine gunner came, come in and mowed down people. And, and, and I thought it was beautiful that Ray was expressing this confounded, conflicted, how does that happen? What makes a person do that? And what I'm bringing that up for is because if we try to love this kind of lost world without first radically loving each other, we get torn apart. We need to be an inside-out church. So what if you knew? What if you knew that, you, that God literally guaranteed that you would always have enough to eat, that you would always have clothes to wear, that you would always have a roof over your head because the church would make sure you did? What if you didn't, what if your faith Instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to trust the check in the mail concept, what if your faith was a lot more tangible? Because God had already provided what you need in the midst of the congregation that you were in. What if you could go to bed tonight saying, you know what, no matter what tomorrow comes, I've got people who love me. I know that if I were to run out of food, they'd feed me. I know that if I were to run short on clothing, they would clothe me. And I know that I know that if, if the bank repoed my house, I could move in with 10 people in this church and they would take care of me until I got my feet under me. Instead of, I know that the government will take care of me. I know that a program will take care of me. I know that a check in the mail might come. What if you knew, I don't have to worry about that stuff. I'm not saying it wouldn't be hard. Listen. That would take a lot of humility, right? To pack up your family and move in with another family. But I don't think that it would be anything other than amazing to be cared for like that and to extend that kind of care. What would it be like if you knew that your needs were already met and you didn't have to worry about that? I think it would be revolutionary. I really, really do. So what does it look like to be a church family who is radically committed to loving each other with our actions and not just our words. What does it look like to become that kind of church? John the Apostle really nails that answer for us in a really straight way, and I want us to listen to this. Would you stand in the honor of reading God's Word? We're going to read 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. If you don't have your Bible or you don't feel like Maybe you're not familiar enough with how to get there real quick. It's on our screen for you. But we, we stand today not out of ritual or habit. We stand because we believe that this is God's truth. This Bible is His Word, and He speaks to us through it. And He says things like this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. Let me read that again. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Now listen to this. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. You mean die? Paul, oh John knew that that wasn't likely to be always the case. And so he answers our, our rhetorical question or our question that's come, the anticipated question with verse 17. In other words, here's what it looks like. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, 
Let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Father, we submit right now to your word, to its authority, to its power, and to its wisdom. Move us to conform to your truth and not to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. All right, what an amazing passage. What an amazing passage. It's really amazing when we take it literally. And I want us to do that because I think this is not anything other than a very literal teaching statement. I think it's powerfully inspiring. And this, this is what he says. This is how we know what love is. The greatest philosophers in the world have pondered this question. What is love? Because it's mystical in so many ways. This emotion that drives teenagers to do crazy things when they first feel the grip of love. And, 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 and for, for people who have experienced the emotional side of this and the swings of love and the ebb and flow and the heartbreak that comes on the other side of love sometimes. It's an amazing, powerful force to, to contemplate and to philosophize over. But John says, we know what love is. We know what it is. It's not... It's not mystical. This is how we know what it is. He said, Jesus, God's Son, the perfect Son of God, the sinless Son of the Father, the, 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 the part of the Trinity who is the expression of God to mankind and, and humanity, Jesus laid down His life for us. That's how we know what love is. Jesus' death on our behalf is a picture and a demonstration of love. What, what love looks like. Because you can't really describe love's feelings. Have you ever noticed that the vast majority of, of songs that aren't, you know, radical and rebellious, so many of them are written about love. The greatest songs in the world are written about love. And what it looks like in describing it. Here we have it. It's our great example. So therefore, we, he says, this is what we do. Jesus physically laid down his life for us. So we should be willing, if he was willing to die for us, how come we couldn't die to ourselves on behalf of one another? That could mean giving up our physical life for our brothers. Absolutely, it could. It's not likely in our setting. It's not. far more likely to cost us time or energy or physical possessions so John reiterates it with his next statement he says now here's what I mean if anyone has material possessions now let me just stop there and just say what, he's, what he means the concept can go so far it can get, it can get obliterated with, with bad translation or understanding of what he means we always take this to an extreme of thinking Oh, well, I can't have anything. I need to get rid of all my stuff so I can give it away to other people. And the problem there is, is if I get rid of all my stuff, then I'm the one in need. I create a need in my life. And that's not the principle. The idea that he's saying is anyone has material possessions, you think, oh, well, I got a TV. In fact, I got four TVs. I got two or three cars or, you know, I, I personally have two, two freezers out in the garage plus one inside. I mean, I have material possessions. I have them. Do I, what do you mean? Do I just go out and get rid of them all and, and give it to somebody? That's not his concept. He, look, what he's saying is, is that we need to be aware that we have stuff. Some of it is expendable stuff, stuff we don't have to have. So the phrase here is talking about those who have material possessions beyond what they literally need. In our culture, this is radically common. In their culture, it wasn't necessarily. But in our day, this is the rule, not the exception. If anyone has enough, and then some, in terms of what it takes to live, that's who he's talking to. So that would be all of us in this room, most likely. So if anyone has material possessions, more than enough to live, and that person sees or is in relationship with a brother or sister in need. So a fellow Christian becomes aware of another Christian who doesn't have enough of the basic necessities for life, for food or clothing or shelter. Okay, today it could include essential bills such as, uh, you know, it could it include bills or transportation or, or uh, a mortgage or, or utilities or 
things like that, okay? Things that they didn't have in an agricultural-based society. So our needs aren't limited. You can't just say your only needs are food, shelter, and clothing. Because sometimes, I mean, it's a need to pay your bills. We need to pay our bills for a variety of reasons, okay? So here's, this, here's all he said. If, if, if a brother or sister who has plenty sees or knows a brother or sister who has a need, and then he says, but, and has no pity on them, but they have no pity on them. Pity is a negative word to us. We don't like to think, I don't want anybody to have pity on me. Okay, but the word pity here means something a little bit different than, than oh, you poor mess. It means, it means to have a deep-seated emotional concern an emotional concern is a good thing. A deep sea, it talks about the, the inner depths, the bowels of your being being stirred with a concern for the welfare of another Christian, of another brother or sister. It's an affectionate, a deeply affectionate regard or sympathy, sympathy for those people. It bothers us, it grips us, it hurts us when somebody is in need, it stirs us, it compels us. So in other words, if, if he says if we don't genuinely care about them and the need they see, that if we have enough, they don't have enough, and we don't have pity on them, if we don't, have, if we don't care, then he asks this great question, how can the love of God be in that person? Isn't that a good question? You ever mull that over? How can I have more than I need and then see somebody who is in need and not care? How can God's love be in me? That doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, it really doesn't. Not if we're honest. That doesn't make any sense at all. If a person can see a brother or sister in true need and that person has the ability to meet the need but doesn't care enough to do so, how can God's love possibly be in that person's life? In other words, how can you say, I love God, but I don't care about my brothers and sisters in Christ? How does that work? John, in this very letter, says, no, 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 that doesn't work. If you say you love God, but you don't love your brothers and sisters, you are a liar. That's what John says. I didn't paraphrase that. He said, you're a liar. You can't say you love God and then love the people who are created in His image who are your spiritual family. Those two things don't mix. Love God, not caring about your spiritual family, you're a liar. I've been a liar. I've made that declaration. I'm not saying that I, I hated God, but I, I, what I was saying is I'm not loving God very well at all when I don't love you practically and tangibly and sacrificially so he says how can the love of God be in that person what's wrong with this picture when something's totally messed up in an otherwise perfect situation and you see this picture of I've got too much this person doesn't have enough and we say go to the welfare office there's nothing wrong with our welfare I mean there is stuff wrong with it but there's nothing wrong with with utilizing that I'm not shaming anybody for that but I do think that the first response should be the church I really do. I think we ought to be the front line defense to go to the church first. So John concludes and he says, let's not love with words or speech. And then you really could put an only in there, okay? Let's not only love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. John's telling them that just saying they love each other doesn't mean anything. doesn't mean anything if those words aren't backed up with actions. We can walk out of here and say, man, brother, I love you. Love you, brother. You can, you can say it all you want. Oh, I care about you or I'm praying for you. But if it's not backed up with actions that are based in the truth, he says, we're liars. We're not getting it done. We're not, we're phony. We're phony. And that, we can say we love each other all day long, but unless we're willing to meet each other's needs with the surplus that God has given us, it could be surplus energy or money or time or emotional expense, unless we're willing to meet each other's needs with action and truth, sincere love for one another, we aren't really loving each other. Because love's a lot more than saying it. So that last verse I read, that's what it's all about. Let us not love with words alone or speech alone, but let's love with actions 
and in truth. I got to tell you, this is uncomfortable because this messes up my life as it revolves around me. Okay, this interrupts my world. My cadence of life is thrown off when I have to take on a responsibility for other people's welfare. And see, when I say it like that, doesn't it sound horrible? Man, what an inconvenience you are. I can't believe you have a need. I guess I've got to meet it. I've got the ability, so I've got to meet it. I've, you know, oh. Aren't you glad that God didn't do that? Aren't you glad that God is not in heaven going, I wish you weren't sinners. I wish I wasn't, you weren't speeding your way into hell. I guess I got to save you. God, I was enjoying the Trinity a lot, and then y'all came along. Aren't you glad? I mean, isn't that different than a desperate, all-out, passionate rescue mission of saying, no, I don't want you to go to hell, I love you. Jesus is going, oh, Father, I don't really want to leave heaven for those people. It's messy down there. They're going to kill me. Yeah, they're going to kill me. But you know what Jesus did? He said, I'll go. Not my will, but yours be done. I'll go. I'll leave heaven. I'll let the ones I created spit in my face, rip the flesh off my back, pull my hair out, mock me, scourge me, hang me on a cross, and, and absolutely defame my glory. I'll do that. I will do that. Because that's their need. And I've got enough to meet their need. I've got sinless perfection to hang on a cross to atone for their need. I'll do it. God, I'm glad that you were willing to do that. Woo! Glad that Jesus is my rescuer. Would you meet other people's needs in the church? Not so much, but I'm glad you rescued me, God. Woo, I'm going to heaven when I die. I've got, man, I've got a closet full of clothes. I've got a refrigerator so full, I, I throw stuff out every year. I've got three cars. I don't need but one, but I've got three. I've got a TV sitting in my basement I hadn't used in months. Man, I'm glad I'm going to heaven. Oh, I hate it when people ask me for stuff. But I'm sure glad I'm going to heaven. Isn't it crazy? I live like that sometimes. I'm that big a hypocrite. Because love is not convenient. That's why he said this whole thing starts with this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us and therefore we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Because really if we're getting it, we're going, how do I repay you? God, how can I possibly do enough to, to, to thank you for rescuing me? And God doesn't say, ah, oh, don't worry about it. You can thank me when you get to heaven. For eternity, you can sing. Till then, just live it up. God does not say that. God says, all of the praise, all of the thankfulness, all of the desire to give back should be poured out upon one another. You got too much? Be willing to share. That's all he says. He does not say give yourself into poverty. He just says give what you have to give to those who might need it. Loving each other in the church is about what we do far more than what we say. Far more than what we say. And so with that, I want to remind you of the three things that we remember about loving each other. First of all, we can't love each other from a distance. I hope you are remembering this phrase. You cannot love each other from a distance. And all I mean by that is casual, convenient relationships do not produce this kind of love. How you doing, brother and sister, in the hallway? You may start there, but if that's the extent of it you can't love each other from a distance you have to get in each other's worlds love is secondly love's not an action love is an action it's not just a feeling it's not just a sentiment that we experience it does involve the emotions it certainly does but it is that's why he says love with actions and in truth because the truth drives us towards 
something that is not just a feeling, but the feeling produces truthful, right actions. And then the third thing I ask you to remember is love is not convenient. It interrupts your life. And that's where you have to remember Jesus. This is how we know what love is, that Christ laid his, laid his life down. Love is never, love is not born out in the realm of convenience. Love is almost always expressed in the realm of cost or sacrifice. So what can you do? What do we do? Becoming this kind of church family starts with bridging the gap and closing the distance in our relationships. That first thing, we can't love each other from a distance. So we are asking you to take simple, small steps. Start conversations with people. And then in those conversations, I challenge you to listen more than you talk. All right, you say, well, if we're both listening to your message, then we're going to sit there and stare at each other because no one's going to talk. No, you talk. No, you talk. No, you talk. I want to be. No, I, be practical about this. Listen long enough to one another. Maybe you're the one who is in need. Okay, then you need to be willing in and through conversations when somebody's expressing concern to express your need. If it is to be loved or cared for, encouraged, begin to express that. If it is a physical need, we're going to talk more about how to meet that. But, but what I'm saying is, is talk to each other. Engage each other. Church, you are really pretty good at this. Uh, it, you, you get on our security team, the closer-uppers after church, and you will find out that, that a lot of people hang out and talk. Okay, You may be talking about the chiefs and you know how they you know, had their one in a hundred year victory over the Cowboys last week or you know it could be it could be yeah yeah you know blind hog finds an acre and every now and then you know you could have those silly conversations they're not silly or you could be talking about brokenness in your life you could be talking about a marriage that's struggling or finances that are vacant or a job that's iffy or a kid that's hurting or it, it starts there pay attention to each other over and over again I'm going to push you to life groups because the best conversations in the world in my sphere happen in our life group as people connect in that small group setting pay attention to what people say invite people over for dinner don't just say hey thanks for see, good to see you on Sunday take time to make a phone call to somebody Send them an email. Text is fine. Do something to move towards each other. Go play putt-putt golf at the sports center. Go to a movie together out of town because you drive and you talk. If you go to a movie here in town, you spend, you know, you meet there, you sit and stare at a movie for two hours, and then you go home. That doesn't build relationship. Go for a walk around Lake Shawnee. Walk your dogs together. Go to the bark park. Take your kids to Gage Park. Do something where you have a context to move towards each other. Because why? We can't love each other from a distance. We can't. We will never move to the other parts of that, of that love as an action until we move towards each other. You'll never move towards the fact that love is sacrificial until we move towards each other. And I really urge you if we're going to shift a culture in a church you have to move toward each other if you believe that we are one another's answered prayer in terms of needs being met all kinds of needs then you have to move towards one each other love is an action and we cannot take action from a distance here's another practical way for, for us to love one another maybe you're not aware but we have a benevolence fund here at covenant and we made a decision about seven years ago that this fund and this doesn't even sound good to the, when, you, when you look at it from the external focus perspective. But I think it's totally biblical. This fund is exclusively for those who are connected to covenant. Not necessarily members, but those who are regular, who have a relationship here. And not so you're paid your dues, but so that you are invested here. This fund is there to meet needs that come up in your life. So we have this system... It's carried out by our deacon body. We have this system set up so that when you have extra, once a month, when we take communion together on that Sunday, 
we take up a benevolence offering. I usually forget to announce this, and our deacons are usually back there waving the plate saying, please announce the benevolence. But here's the deal. We give to that. Whether you give $5 or $500, doesn't matter, but we give to that so that if somebody in our congregation has a need, and let's say they're not in a life group or no one has a relationship with them, that they could come to Roger or to me or to one of our deacons and say, listen, uh, here's where we are between jobs or or we had an expected medical bill or something, and we have a need here, and we just can't, we can't make it. Can you guys help us? And we say yes. First time that somebody comes, we don't ask a lot of questions. We just, we just take you on your word and say, yes, we're, we'll help you meet that need. The second time, if it began to be a pattern, I know I'm going to answer your questions. If we don't want to create a dependent society in our culture, in our church, either. So if there begins to be a repetitive need, we won't just say, oh, we're done helping you, one and out. But we may step in a little closer and say, can we look with you, you know, at your finances and how things are going? Maybe, maybe we could help you fix your own problem. Not in a judgmental, critical way or nosy way, like, so let's see where you're wasting money. But how can we come alongside of you to help you use the resources better? And we may come alongside of you and say, yeah, man, you have an income problem. That is, that there's not enough coming in, and there's more going out, and there's not much you can do, and we will help you until you get your feet. Or we might be able to say, listen, have you ever looked at this option or that option? But we can help each other, see? And the Benevolence Fund is an awesome way for someone who only has $5 extra a month or to help just as much proportionally to the person who can give $500 a month. And my goal, I would love to have $10,000 in our benevolence fund. I would love to have that so that no one would say, because I know we've got people say, oh, I would like to use that, but there's going to be someone be more in need than me, and I don't want to tax it. I just don't want to drain it. And so I'm not going to express my need. But I want, for th this would be an awesome thing, for you to go to bed at night knowing, listen, I don't have to worry. I'm going to do everything I can do to meet my needs and to be responsible and to work hard and manage my money well. But if worse comes to worse and I cannot pay the mortgage one month, I can go to my congregation and they'll help me. They will help me. They will not promote laziness or lack of responsibility or a dependent culture, but they will help meet needs that I can't meet. Wouldn't it be awesome? I think we're almost there. We do have three or... Uh, cl sometimes close to $4,000 in this benevolence fund. And if you can give to it, I ask you to give to it. But listen, we can't meet needs that we don't know exist. See, the harder thing than giving to benevolence is receiving. It's harder to come and say, I have a need. And it's harder because we don't want to be judged and we don't want to be looked down upon and men in particular have this need to be the providers and we don't feel like we failed but I gotta tell you something that's baloney if you got a need we need to know we need to know now I'm gonna give you an addendum to that and we're almost done if you know of a need and you have the ability to meet the need then you should meet the need first don't say I got enough I could help them but hey why don't you go to use the benevolence fund because sometimes God is going to bring you somebody that he wants you to minister to and you to share with. Okay? So it may be you share food. It may be that you give baby clothes away or a crib or you loan a car or you help buy groceries or you give somebody a ride. Listen, here's what James says. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food and one of you, an individual... One of you says to them, hey, go in peace, be warmed and be filled. Maybe the benevolence fund will take care of you. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What, is, what use is that? In other words, we have a personal responsibility to this. We don't just throw money in the benevolence fund and say, I'm abdicated of all personal responsibility. We do both. We give and we meet needs as we are able Loving one another doesn't just mean that we're helping each other financially. It could mean that you babysit for our youth pastor and his wife who have far too little time together. It could mean that you loan a car to somebody who's down to no car or down to one car and you got three. It might mean that you uh, give somebody loving advice or counsel or give somebody of your time or that you have a resource or an ability to paint a house or, or, or cut a dead tree down or fix a fence or, or work on a car. 
But I'm urging you to pay attention to the needs God makes known to you and assume you are supposed to be a part of meeting the need. Let's join together in creating a radical culture of loving each other at Covenant Baptist Church that that would be our rep among our city. So much so that anybody that gets near us knows that they're going to be swept up into that love. It's not exclusive. It's not members only. It's not an inside track. It is just this love that that boils within the congregation so much it spills out. I do that every time I boil spaghetti noodles and I think of this. I always put too much water in. It's all over my stove. That's what love looks like in the church. It's not containable. It always spills out. I'm dreaming of a day when you wake up on Sunday morning, when you wake up and you go, I'm going to a place that I'm radically loved. Those people care that I'm there. Those people care when I'm not there. Those people care about me. I'm going to celebrate with those people that we have eternal life in Jesus. I get to sing about that. I get to wash myself in the Word of God. And I get to be immersed in a culture, if only for an hour a week, where I am radically loved. I'm dreaming of a day you'd wake up, and that would be why you come to worship. Not because it is Sunday, and that's what you do. Because you could not stand missing being around people who really love us. Who among us wouldn't want to come celebrate all that God has done for us with a bunch of people who authentically are committed to loving each other and loving God in real ways? Who wouldn't want that? I do. I think you do. I know you do. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the profound counsel that is there, the direction that it gives, the hope that it offers, the inspiration that it leaves us with. Now, God, help us to do what we've heard. Help us to shift this. We don't need a program. We don't need an initiative. We've been bathed in the truth. Help us to love in actions and in truth, not just with words. Help us to become that church. In Jesus' name, amen. I think the most loving thing you could ever do for somebody is to share the gospel with them, to share the truth of Jesus. Not in a, ha, I got the truth and you don't way, but in a passionate plea for somebody's eternal destiny in mind. A desire to see somebody come into relationship with God that has never been born into that relationship. I think that's the most loving thing that we could ever do. And I think that's the heartbeat, I know it is, of our mission. To make disciples that make disciples. In our meeting last night, we talked about that. Where does that whole process start of making disciples? Faith in Jesus. Reaching into a lost person's world with the truth that God loves them beyond their sin and that God has provided a solution for their sin that he's bridged the gap with the offering of his own son Jesus dying on a cross so that you and I could proclaim that through faith in Jesus eternal life is granted and given as a gift from God to broken humanity not church membership not giving enough money not learning enough Bible salvation is a gift from God through faith in Jesus alone if you have never placed your faith in Jesus alone we invite you to do that in fact I would invite you to do that this morning I would invite you to do it right now and we would give you an opportunity to respond in a couple ways I, I realize that if that is your decision or if you have questions about that you may need to talk to somebody and not just feel compelled to do it right now without any discussion so if you want to have a, a discussion about the gospel, about what it means to come into a relationship with God, would you take your worship tear off, that thing that tears off your bulletin, would you indicate that? Just say, I want to talk about what it means to be saved, to have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. If you're already there and you know, listen, this is what I'm going to do, I'm done, I've answered my questions, I just need to make, seal the deal, then I would encourage you to stand up in a moment and come down in front of our congregation. You don't have to do this. This is not part of what it takes to be saved, but this is a great way to do it. And say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. Because if you can't do that here, if you can never make a public profession of your faith here, among people who are going to literally probably clap for you and weep with joy over your decision, 
it will be really, really hard to go out into the world and tell people that you are a follower of Jesus. So I think it's a good thing to stand up and come down front. Not just because I'm Southern Baptist and we love invitations. I just think it's a good thing. Now, if you're saying, no way, Jose, I'm not going to do that. So if that's part of salvation, I'm not going to do it. Stay where you are. But have, just please write it down. Drop it in the offering plate and let us take the next move. We'll do it. Okay, church, let's respond to the truth we've heard right now. We're going to, uh, we do an instrumental. I'm going to have you stay seated then, okay? So you can reflect on what God's telling you to do. Just for a few minutes, this is your time to say yes or no to God. But not doing anything, let me just tell you, saying, you know, going to where you're going to eat lunch or if you're going to go to Bible study or no, you're checking, no, God, I'm not listening, okay? So you need to respond to God. If you're going to say no to God, just do an all out, God, I'm not ready, no. But let's say yes or no to whatever God's asking you to do, okay? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this time in our service that we can give back. We can give back from the things that, that we have that we don't use all the time. We can give money. We can give other things. Father, I ask that you would bless each person today as they give. And Father, let them give with a clear conscience. And Father, as the money comes in, and the tithes and the offerings. Father, as a church, help us to direct that to, to reach the world, to reach the lost, and to make disciples of disciples. And Father, we'll give you the glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Roger. I want to encourage you to sing or not sing. It's up to you. Concentrate mostly on the words. And no one caught yep. in mm -hmm. sin remain inside the light of inward shame, but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to Him who showed then bled for us. Freely you bled for us. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave.
risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the dead. Amen. That is true. That's the gospel. We just sang the good news in a powerful way. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, I want to give you a reminder. Uh, as one of our deacons reminded me, I think this is very, very important, that if you do express a need to the benevolence ministry, generally that need will be contained information-wise, well, exclusively, not generally, to the deacon that you talk to and possibly one or two other deacons. I generally do not know, uh, almost unless I'm consulted about it. But it will be two to three people who will hold in confidence your need, okay? You need to know that. All right, uh, we've taken up our offering. We've asked you to express your worship through there. We've got one more thing we're going to do before we break, and that is to promote ShareFest. Um, we've got a video that we want to see. Is that right? I'm on the right page. We've got a video. ShareFest is a shared uh, ministry opportunity in our community where we really put out an effort to go express the love of Jesus in a very practical way to 501 School District uh, and meet needs that won't go, will go unmet. If we don't step in and meet some of those physical needs. So we get to paint. Do you think this? We get to paint, clean up, trim, mulch, do all this stuff. So when kids come back, they're like, what happened to our school? What happened? In one, I mean, we've got lines on our basketball court. We've got trees that have mulched and trimmed. Our doors are painted. What happened? And the ministers are going to say, churches came this week. And they blessed you. And I want you to be a part of that. Let's look at this video. There are school after school after school, and here's the deal. We live in an age where people say, I'm not going to church because the church is full of... It's hard to call uh, us hypocrites if, if they come and see that we've come and loved them, asked nothing of them, and blessed them. It changes the reputation of the bride of Jesus. So I want 100 people from Covenant to be a part of this. On October 5th, you can sign up right over here. 100 people committed to saying... I'm not going to let the reputation of the church continue to plummet. I'm going to come and I'm going to be a part. Yes, ma'am. I don't know the answer to your question, but I'm guessing no. No, you do not have to. Randy's right there. Okay? She'll, he'll do it for you. You sign up there, he'll fill it out online for you. 100 people. Come on, let's do it. All right? God bless you. You are dismissed for Bible study.